We are now in our last part of the Odyssey, part three, the return of the hero. Chapter 13, the meeting of father and son. In book 13, Odysseus, laden with gifts, is returned in secret to Ithaca in one of the magically swift Phaeacian ships. In Ithaca, Athena herself appears to the hero. She advises him how to proceed and disguises him as a beggar. Notice that this new hero of the post-war age of disillusionment will achieve success not only by physical power, but also by guile and wisdom. In book 14, Odysseus, in his beggar disguise, finds his way to the house of his old and trusty swineherd, Eumaeus. Eumaeus is the very image of faithfulness in a servant, a quality much prized by Homer's society. The introduction of the so-called servant class as important actors is unusual in epic poetry, and it indicates Homer's originality. Odysseus is simply but politely entertained in the swineherd hut. He remains disguised from Eumaeus. In Book 13, we go back to Telemachus, who is still with Menelaus and Helen. The plots of the father and son are now about to be brought together. Athena appears to the boy and advises him to return home. She warns him that the evil suitors plan to ambush him. Telemachus boards ship for home, lands secretly on Ithaca, and heads towards the cottage of the swineherd. As father and son were moved closer and closer together, the suspense in the audience must have become great. Now Homer is ready for what could be the most dramatic moment in the epic. But there were two men in the mountain hut, Odysseus and the swineherd. At first light, blowing their fire up, they cooked their breakfast and sent their lads out, driving herds to root in the tall timber. When Telemachus came, the wolvish troops of watchdogs only fawned on him as he advanced. Odysseus heard them go and heard the light crunch of a man's footfall at which he turned quickly to say, Eumaeus, here is one of your crew come back, or maybe another friend. The dogs are out there sniffling, belly down. No one has even growled. I can hear footsteps. But before he finished, his tall son stood at the door. The swine herd rose in surprise, letting a bowl and jug tumble from his fingers. Going forward, he kissed the young man's head, his shining eyes in both hands, while his own tears brimmed and fell. Think of a man whose dear and only son, born to him in exile, reared with labor, has lived ten years abroad and now returns. How would that man embrace his son? Just so the herdsman clasped his arms around Telemachus and covered him with kisses, for he knew the lad had got away from death. He said, Light of my days, Telemachus, you made it back. When you took ship for Pylos, I never thought to see you here again. Come in, dear child, and let me feast my eyes. Here you are, home from the distant places. How rarely, anyway, you visit us, your own men in your own woods and pastures. Always in the town, a man would think you love the suitor's company, those dogs. Telemachus, with his clear candor, said, I am with you, uncle. See, now I have come because I wanted to see you first, to hear from you if mother stayed at home, or is she married off to someone, and Odysseus's bed left empty for some gloomy spider's weaving. Gently the forester replied to this, At home indeed your mother is, poor lady still in the women's hall. Her nights and days are wearied out with grieving. Stepping back, he took the bronze-shod lance, and the young prince entered the cabin over the worn door stone. Odysseus moved aside, yielding his couch, but from across the room, Telemachus checked him. Friend, sit down. We'll find another chair in our own hut. Here is the man to make one. The swine heard when the quiet man sent Dan, built a new pile of evergreens and fleece as a couch for the dear son of great Odysseus, and gave him trenchers of good meat left over from the roast pork of yesterday, and heaped up willow baskets full of bread, and mixed an ivy bowl of honey-hearted wine. And he in turn sat down, facing Odysseus. Their hands went out upon the meat and drink as they fell to, ridding themselves of hunger. Not realizing that the stranger is his father, Telemachus agrees to protect him as best he can. But he tells the beggar that he cannot stay in the palace at all, because he would be abused by the drunken suitors. The wine herd is sent to Penelope with news of her son's return. And now it seems that even Athena cannot stand the suspense any longer. She turns to Odysseus in beggar's rags. She tipped her golden wand upon the man, making his cloak pure white and the knit tunic fresh around him. Lithe and young she made him, ruddy with sun, his jawline clean, the beard no longer gray upon his chin. And she withdrew when she had done. Then Lord Odysseus reappeared, and his son was thunderstruck. Fear in his eyes, he looked down and away as though he were a god, and whispered, Stranger, you are not longer what you were just now. Your cloak is new, even your skin. You are one of the gods who rules the sweep in heaven. Be kind to us, we'll make you fair oblation, and the gifts of hammered gold have mercy on us. The noble and enduring man replied, No, God, why take me for a God? No, no. I am that father whom your boyhood lacked and suffered pain for lack of. I am he. Held back too long, the tears ran down his cheeks as he embraced his son. 
Only Telemachus, uncomprehending, wild out with incredulity, walked. Held back for too long, the tears ran down his cheeks as he embraced his son. Only Telemachus, uncomprehending, wild with incredulity, cried out, You cannot be my father, Odysseus. Meddling spirits conceived this trick to twist the knife in me. No man of woman born could work these wonders by his own craft, unless a god came into it with case to turn him young or old at will. I swear you are in rags and old, and here you stand like one of the immortals. Odysseus brought his raging mind to bear and said, this is not princely to be swept away by wonder at your father's presence. No other Odysseus will ever come, for he and I are one, the same. His bitter fortune and his wanderings are mine, twenty years gone, and I am here back again on my own island. Then throwing his arms around the marvel of a father, Telemachus began to weep. Salt tears rose from the wells of longing in both men, and cries burst from both as keen and fluttering as those of the great talent hawk, whose nesting farmers take before they fly. So helplessly they cried, pouring out tears, and might have gone on weeping, so till sundown. And that concludes chapter 16 of the Odyssey.